All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the hey, Lightning Talks. Oh, sorry, Carlos. Are, are we live? I think we're live. Um, I am here to introduce to all of you Dr. Jerry Chow, who I'm very excited for on behalf of IBM Quantum. Uh, just very quickly, I want to say let's go 49ers today. I hope you're all rooting for them to win. But um, Jerry Chow, who I'm thrilled to introduce, is a renowned physicist and one of the world's leading researchers in quantum computing and information processing. Dr. Chow currently leads IBM Quantum's hardware system development efforts, sitting at the interface of research and system development. Uh, I'm sorry, system deployment. Uh, he serves as IBM's primary investigator in the multi-qubit coherent operations program at the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, which is IARPA, uh, which conducts quantum computing research with the potential for national intelligence applications. Y'all are very, very lucky to have Dr. Jerry Chow here to cap off. I know you've had some amazing talks already today, but the event you've been a part of, this MIT hackathon, you have such a strong group of people from all around the world to participate. So we are thrilled that you're all here. Just right before he starts, I wanna let you know that Dr. Chow co-leads the IBM Quantum Experience Project with none other than Jay Gambetta, ever heard of him, uh, which put the very first quantum computer on the cloud in 2016. He earned his master's from Harvard, his PhD from Yale, where his team created superconducting qubits coupled via a cavity bus for the first time ever. Ladies and gentlemen, none other than Dr. Jerry Chow. Jerry. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the, the <laughs> detailed introduction, Brian. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be with you all today. Uh, it it's, uh, sounds like it's been a tremendous event, and, and I'm very glad uh, to, to have the chance to uh, be a part of this. And, and I know it's late, late in the weekend, um, but uh, I'm very happy to, to tell you a little more about kind of what's been going on uh, from, a, from a hardware and from an overall uh, system perspective um, from, from IBM Quantum standpoint. Um, and so where I want to talk to you about today is, is, is uh, kind of the transition, transition that we've had uh, in just a few years, in, in just the last uh, five plus years or so of, of, of really kind of pushing the envelope in what's possible with uh, deployed quantum computing systems. Right, so if we look at uh, 2016, and, and uh, that was that was uh, as what Brian mentioned, this this first quantum experience project that that uh, Jay and myself uh, co-led, uh, but it was about putting a, a simple programmable system on the cloud, uh, had a nice easy interface for running quantum circuits, uh, and it's really evolved, right? So I mean, since then we've had uh, over 700 papers that are using our uh, IBM Quantum Services uh, today. Each day, there's three billion quantum circuits run, right? And so that's um, that that just effectively shows the the level that that things have grown. Uh, and for 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 one thing, rather than just being in a research environments, we today have these system ones that are uh, deployed, uh, fully contained into these these systems as shown in the right here. Uh, and in fact, they sit all around the world. Um, and today, in, in January 2021, I'm very proud to say that we have over 20 quantum computing systems that are all online accessible to, to both the public, to, to a combination of the public and our IBM quantum network. And so this includes uh, a, the a industry leading 127 qubit system is uh, IBM Washington uh, and includes a, a 65 qubit system, IBM Q Brooklyn, as well as a, a whole a host of other 27 qubit systems, seven qubit system, five qubit systems, basically ones for targeting all, a whole bunch of different types of applications. And as you can see here on our, our main page that, uh, that, that features all these services uh, with a lot of detail in terms of both uh, benchmarks and metrics that, that describe them. Um, now, also for, with the perspective of those systems, uh, we've been deploying these all over the world. And for that matter, driving strategic partnerships throughout the world in order to uh, centralize locally in these different areas, um, uh, a, a, a new ecosystem developed around uh, access to these types of, uh, um, uh, basically you can think of it as, as, as you know, quantum computing uh, deployed system, right? So not only do we have uh, these systems that are deployed here in, in, the, in New York, in, in Poughkeepsie, but then also we've uh, just last year, we had a, a system deployed in Germany uh, with the Fraunhofer Institute and one in Japan. 
uh, with the University of Tokyo, and we have others in play, uh, in plan with uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, in Ohio, as well as with uh, Yonsei University in, in South South Korea. Now, uh, taking a step back, though, I, I think it's important to understand why, what what are we doing? Like, what's so special about um, about these systems, and 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 what are we uh, building towards, right? And uh, the way that we like to look at it is really from the perspective of running quantum circuits. When we talk about you know quantum computers or or or, or computation, we sometimes you know land on the idea of the bits and qubits, right? But actually, I think the most fundamental unit to describe when we talk about quantum computing is the quantum circuit, and it consists of a uh, of a register of qubits, right? And it and effectively has different gate operations, and and you know. You, we piece together these gate operations plus measurements that turn information to classical information. And these, these circuits advance quantum computations, right? It effectively allows us to um, explore uh, things on a real quantum system. Uh, and it's running these quantum circuits that we are able to drive applications and drive uh, areas to learn about, which we have really potentially no classical analog such as simulating quantum systems, right? And that's breaking it down in terms of looking at uh, novel chemistry, novel physics systems, material science, uh, to looking at uh, specific types of algebraic problems, right? This is, and there's a lot of interest in how, uh, you know, the, the quantum enhanced feature spaces can impact machine learning and AI, um, or looking at particular types of problems with, with inherent structure in them, such as uh, for, for solving differential equations or factoring. And then the third category in terms of uh, what you can probably think of as, as search problems, driving quadratic speedups, sampling problems, op graph problems, and optimization. Um, but really, the, the, the idea that we're, we're marching towards, right, and especially if we look at that, um, what's been happening since 2016, is, is effectively we want to drive the capabilities of our systems to uh, have the cap capacity to run a lot of circuits. So I mentioned before that we're at the, the level today. In fact, this number is a little bit outdated. We're at 3 billion circuits a day. Uh, and we expect to see this continued exponential growth as we progress. And what's more there is that this is even in this, what we call pre-quantum advantage phase, right? Where we don't necessarily have proven quantum advantage business applications yet. And at some point in, within the next decade, we do expect to see that. And there we expect to see even the this, this trend um, both con continue to scale up uh, in, with in terms of number of circuits run, and perhaps even uh, even greater uh, uh, greater needs. Uh, and so, really, the question becomes: How do we meet the demand, right, for these types of quantum systems? And also, how do we bring quantum hardware at such a, such a level that we know that we are marching in the right path to uh, implementing these types of, uh, uh, you know, eventually quantum applications and quantum um, quantum advantage in the right way? And that's why last year, um, IBM Quantum, we released this very detailed development roadmap um, where effectively we pictured in the future, right, what we call a frictionless uh, access point to quantum computing. We want to get to the point where uh, users don't ne necessarily need to know about the nitty gritty details of what's underlying the quantum systems, how cu the qubits work, how the quantum circuits actually turn into pulses that are, you know, uh, in a microwave regime. Uh, rotating these Josephson's injunction qubits. We, we don't need to know any of that. We want to be able to have model developers and end users uh, effectively run their workloads and application uh, workloads in the same way that they do and compute and use uh, consume traditional computing today. But how do we get there, right? To get there requires breaking it down into a multi-year roadmap, targeting different types of users, all um, built upon a foundation of, of, of improving quantum hardware. Right. And so this means having a layer that just scales and improves the performance of our quantum systems, having a layer which allows us to uh, target those developers that are going to fill in a lot of the key glue for making this a frictionless future from understanding how uh, classical and quantum interface in a very seamless way to developing things such as uh, the quantum compilers and how applications can be built uh, uh, compiled down into uh, the natural language of the actual physical hardware. And then at the very top, the, defining the right way that uh, application users uh, can have effectively services uh, that, that, that are in line with their traditional workloads and not necessarily need to know all those details within, right? 
and and so um, from the from the hardware's perspective, and I'll give you you know if this is this is the the core area of of of, of uh, uh, my team and what we're looking into is is how do we how do we really get that bedrock of of improved systems and drive key computing quantum computing performance metrics to enable that type of frictionless future, uh, and so. Uh, we came up with a simple rubric, which is that there's performance, and performance is is uh, equal to three different pieces. There's scale, which is effectively the number of qubits you have. Quality, which we can think of as a measure of of, of a metric called quantum volume, and speed, which is uh, effectively the, the the total circuits per second that you can run through the system. And and scale, we can think of pretty simply, right? It effectively says if you have larger numbers of uh, larger number of qubits, you have larger problems which you can address on a quantum computer. But you need to make sure that those uh, qubits, right, there actually can be used for performing circuits. It, it doesn't make any sense if you just have qubits that are just you know laying there on a silicon chip or laying in a trap somewhere that don't perform actually as part of your algorithms. Um, uh, so scale is an important thing. Quality also is really key, right? In terms of when you're running these circuits, how faithfully is it actually implemented in the hardware? This means having lower errors, uh, pushing in this metric called quantum volume. And then with speed, this is about be really bringing practicality to, this, to these types of uh, compute systems. You wanna have a very seamless interplay between what can run on a quantum computer, what can run on a classical computer, and you need to run these circuits through the system really fast. And so uh, let me, I just wanna to touch on each of these uh, really quickly. Uh, scale, right? This is about uh, basically driving generation after generation of hardware, but much like uh, has been done in, in traditional uh, CMOS scaling in the past, hitting particular technological delivery points year after year to scale up our, 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 our quantum processor units, right? So a few years ago, we had Falcon at 27 qubits, uh, then Hummingbird at 65 qubits, and most recently uh, our drop point was Eagle with 127 qubits, where we solved a very critical scalable packaging problem of having multi-level wiring as well as uh, integrate, integrated um, through substrate vias. And this year our plan 2022 is to drive towards Osprey, which is at 433 qubits, um, and next year towards over 1,000 qubits with Condor. And so here's just a nice uh, little uh, rendition to show how Eagle is constructed. It's broken down into multi different layers uh, and it's really taken us to a new realm of what we can actually build from a hardware standpoint. Uh, in the past, we basically had to build these uh, superconducting quantum processors either in a single plane or at most two planes. And what we've been able to do now is to really start to imagine how we can use a lot of the, uh, the ideas from uh, silicon processing to have more layers to, to effectively bring in more signal delivery and allow us to scale a lot more efficiently while not ruining uh, the underlying coherence or the underlying performance of the device. And so that was really the key um, uh, uh, driver for, for Eagle, which was to show that we could in fact build in this type of uh, advanced packaging techniques. Uh, and so today we are hosting this system that is available uh, over the cloud IBM Washington at 127 qubits. You can see the device map here on the right, uh, and effectively, you know, it performs in terms of uh, performs uh, uh, quite well. We have we've even benchmarked it from a quantum volume perspective, um, and uh, have a full suite of of, of uh, numbers in terms of error rates and and so forth uh, available online. Now, quality is also very important, and the thing with our roadmaps is that we drive on things such as scale. In, along one dimension. And then we're also pushing on how to improve the underlying quality on another dimension. A lot of these things all happen in parallel and different processors have different cycles of learning and different cycles of, of, of build times. Um, and so uh, to, to drive on uh, uh, quality, so, such as um, uh, it means that I'm really improving how well the underlying circuits run, means I'm improving the qubit quality like coherence times or how well the uh, gates actually run, so improving the gate fidelities. Um, and this is all captured into one measure, measure that we like to use called the quantum volume, uh, which tries to capture what is the largest square shaped circuit that you can run across any, any quantum processor. Um, and so this, we have been continuously uh, doubling this quantum volume every year, every year. And we hit QV128 uh, with our Montreal device. Uh, um, and yeah, we're, we're actively working on, on pushing this beyond that. Um, 
And a big part of how we're doing that is driving the improvements in coherence and gate fidelity. Last year, we saw uh, remarkable improvements in the uh, median uh, um, coherence times for our Falcon processors. So as we cycled through Falcon from revision five to revision eight, we saw a three X improvement. And we have uh, we expect even more improvements in the future as some of our test devices uh, are reaching six X improvements. And then similarly, the, the, the plot on the right really shows how we have driven um, two qubit error rates along this path of really reducing their error rates uh, year after year with new generations, and most recently hitting three nines of fidelity on our uh, revision 10 Falcon exploratory system. And so the last thing that, uh, last element there is speed, right? And so the idea of speed is that um, when we're running these quantum circuits, any type of real problem or workload you wanna run, uh, you need to have speed so that uh, you can actually uh, run real practical workloads. Any real workload is going to have probably uh, uh, millions, if not billions, of circuits that you'd need to run. And so the throughput by which you get the circuits through your quantum processor processed by your classical computer is really paramount to actually solving problems of interest. So, for example, performing those machine learning tasks or performing those chemical simulation tasks. And so speed, um, there are a few, few things that come into play, some at the hardware level, some at the classical uh, electronics level. So for example, the, the control electronics, and then also the, the um, software level. So how circuits are actually compiled and, and actually um, processed by the uh, electronics in an efficient way to signal the, the time to run the next circuit, for example. Um, and last year we had a big, big uh, jump in terms of speed as well for our um, many of our systems, uh, effectively having a, a 15x uh, a reduction in the total readout speed. Um, and for, for that matter, we also uh, introduced this concept of Qiskit runtime, uh, which effectively is a containerized version of your full uh, computation, but, but allows us to effectively do the, the complete uh, quantum and classical uh, part of any type of uh, uh, circuit run that you might want to have in a much more localized fashion, rather than taking many kind of round trips over the cloud. In, in the past, you might send a circuit, it goes to some cloud server, uh, it, you run it through the quantum processor, the results come back to you, uh, and then it kind of processes the next loop and so forth. With runtime, we have that fully containerized in a, in a localized um, uh, construct to effectively speed up this total amount of time. And last year, we showed 120x overall QPU speed improvement. And so this is really important when we talk, look across the landscape of these different items, right? In terms of what can we actually uh, achieve in terms of performance by different architectures? And it's why we're so excited at IBM Quantum with our superconducting qubits, which is that we see really no gaps in terms of driving continued improvements in quantum volume for, for quality. Uh, we have a, a defined roadmap for how we're going to scale in terms of uh, looking at new technologies to increase the total qubit count. And then for that matter, also from a speed perspective, compared to many of the other technologies, a very straightforward path to continue to improve uh, the numbers of operations that we can perform and the classical integration in these types of runtime environments. And so uh, we're excited for our development roadmap. We have a, a new new steps in the in the roadmap for this coming year, including uh, the, the uh, uh, Osprey uh, demonstration with 433 qubits, as well as uh, targeting dynamic circuits as as a big part of uh, the uh, the the layer for circuit developers. Um, and so that we do expect that uh, we'll continue to drive performance from the hardware standpoint, improving scale, improving quality, improving speed. So I want to close by saying that it's a very exciting time, right? There's certainly a lot to be done in terms of driving forward uh, uh, this entire effort as a community. Uh, a big part of, of, of how you can get engaged is, is through a lot of the open source materials that we have out there and all, all of the resources that we have through IBM Quantum. And so just kind of quickly to run through each of these, um, uh, we, have a, we have the Qiskit textbook, which is uh, online. It's located at this link here, where you can really run, uh, 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 run experiments that get launched onto actual quantum systems and see uh, a step-by-step -step walkthrough for, for how to learn and, and, and engage in quantum computing. 
Um, certainly a lot of other videos, tutorials, and guides that talk through all, a, a lot of the things that I described today in more detail, including how Qiskit runtime works. Um, there's certainly a path towards, towards getting uh, developer certification, right? And so uh, we have uh, really been excited to have this program in the, for the past years, uh, getting the certification program for how to program a quantum computer. We also have a very active Qiskit YouTube channel with uh, tremendous numbers of, of, of uh, luminary speakers on a weekly basis coming to, to give lectures and, and uh, drive tutorials and, and as well as giving community updates. Um, and then, uh, and then, lastly, I want to I want to really advertise this exciting summer summer school that we have this year. We've had uh, um, a tremendous uh, um, uh, following with with our su summer schools in the past few years, and this year we're focusing on quantum error correction. And you know, the quantum error correction is certainly a huge part of 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 uh, how to reach uh, the full potential for quantum computers. And we really are excited to have this uh, summer school dedicated towards that. In, we're expecting a month long in-person event, fingers crossed for that uh, in July in, uh, in New York. And so with that, I wanna leave you all with these uh, other resources. You can find more about our quantum systems that are available today uh, at quantumcomputing.ibm.com and more about our, our open source quantum software framework at kiskit.org. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that fantastic talk. Lots of exciting uh, things happening at IBM Quantum and lots of ways for people to get involved. Um, we have a ton of questions, great questions rolling in in, in the Twitch. So I'm just going to go through them um, in the time we have remaining. Uh, how is the qubit layout decided for, for these um, QPUs? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, if, we, if I go back to... Um... Uh, if I, let me just go back to, to our Eagle processor layout. Um, effectively, we, we, we have this um, arrangement currently, which we call this a, a heavy hexagonal layout. Um, it's, um, it's basically, imagine a, a, a honeycomb lattice, a hexagonal lattice, and we place qubits on the, on the vertices as well as the faces. Uh, and the reason why we choose that particular uh, arrangement is that for the underlying gates that we are running, uh, they're microwave-based gates. We found this to have the, the, the highest uh, probability of yield and lowest amount of crosstalk. So really it's kind of from a, from a hardware perspective why we choose this, that it's, it's most efficient in terms of uh, reducing the types of errors that, that, are, that can be the biggest uh, threat to uh, our particular system. Thank you. Yeah. The next uh, question is, um, is IBM working into uh, other kinds of superconducting qubits besides transmon like fluxonium or zero pi qubits? Yeah, that's also a, a really interesting question. And I think, you know, one of these, one of the exciting things about being in, in industry um, is that, you know, we are in a position to um, take really great ideas and find ways to um, kind of take them to the next level in terms of of of, of scaling and, and engineering and bringing in and bringing in other um, facets facets of development. Uh, we've certainly uh, have have had many years of expertise in our belts now with the transmon qubits. It's exciting to see a lot of the work that's being done with uh, you know zero pi and fluxonium. Um, I think you know we want to see. Uh, a little bit more in terms of, 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 of how they're going to continue to scale with, with regards to reliable two qubit gates and things like yield. But, um, you know, from an from a interest standpoint, certainly, you know, I think that having these types of uh, diversity of, of qubits being studied throughout the, the field and, and, and certainly in academia uh, is a big selling point for, for uh, is a big point of, of, of interest for us. Uh, the next uh, next question is, um, what is the uh, pro or do you see mid-sized companies um, leveraging quantum advantage in their own workflows? So I, you know, I think this is this is um, something interesting to be looking into, right? Like there's there's clearly uh, uh, you know where we are at the moment. Uh, we have a quantum network that has. Um, uh, over 170 companies that are engaged with us, many of them ranging from, uh, you, you know, the, the, the more like Fortune 5, Fortune, you know, 100 types uh, who, have, who have expansive research budgets and are looking into how quantum impacts their, their work, even if it's, you know, many years down the road. 
uh, to others, including startups that are, are probably playing more within the ecosystem, right? And so, so for the mid, the mid-sized companies, I'd say, you know, it's, 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 it's probably a question of um, how I would almost ask, how would they uh, consume computing, right? And, and if they are certainly, you know, aligned with needing, um, uh, you know, computation from a very uh, high performance computation from, you know, from the perspective of like, as it's evolving with, with, with uh, you know, machine learning and AI today, I certainly see that the, the, the need for quantum computing to help them drive advantage could play a role, right? And so, you know, I don't think it's ever too early to, to get in, in, involved. We certainly have um, a multi-step process that we, we, we have for all companies of all different kinds. Uh, it's called the Quantum Accelerator Offering. Um, and it effectively helps, you know, um, companies from a standpoint of learning just what it is and, and kind of walking through how it might impact uh, uh, their workloads, you know, if not now, but certainly down the road. Thank you so much. Uh, final questions for running out of time. Um, for all the aspiring quantum computing and uh, uh, research scientists and engineers in, in the Twitch, um, what, what are some tips from your own journey to get to the point where you are right now? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a very exciting time to be in, right? And I think that a big part of it is, you know, for me, I think um, I kind of got into this when, when the um, when you know the 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 idea of working in industry was 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 probably you know a little less popular, right? And today, I think we're in a in a in a in a um, in a field where industry is a big part of of the whole quantum computing landscape. Um, you know, my personal feeling uh, and my personal advice here is that you know look look where you might not expect, right? And um, you know, be pretty broad in terms of what you're looking for. Uh, and you might be surprised with, you know, exactly what is the right fit for, for yourself. Well, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for closing off our lightning talks for iCLI. It was a real pleasure to host you. Um, and yeah, and we will start uh, the award ceremony and final remarks at 6 p.m. So we have a 30 minute break. Uh, they'll be held on Twitch. Uh, see you all there. Yeah. My pleasure.